So before we start, uh, I'd like to get to know you or the audience a little bit more. Um, so my name is Pierre. I'm a developer in Azure IoT. Um, so we work mostly on the cloud side, and I do um, SDK work, so both on the device and the service side to help stuff connect to Azure IoT. What do you guys do? In general, are you more on the embedded side or cloud side? So who's embedded developer? Right, low level, bare metal stuff, cool. Um, what about cloud architects and you do everything? Cool. Um, okay, so more of an embedded crown. Who's doing, well, I guess everybody's doing embedded Linux. Anyone ever touched a Microsoft embedded thing? Yeah, okay. That was a while ago. So. A Microsoft embedded thing? Used to be, you used to have Windows a pretty, pre that back, it, back in the days, no way, yeah, Windows CE was, was a nice play at some point. Uh, we do have a thing called IoT Corp, but that's definitely not the topic of today's talk, because it's a Linux crowd, so. Cool, shall we get started? Okay. And, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess we're gonna get started. All right, so welcome, thanks for um, sticking around. I know I'm the last thing before lunch too, so I'll try to finish on time if not early. Uh, we're gonna be talking about Azure IoT in general. It's going to be an overview. Um, I will get into a little more of the specifics of that component called IoT Hub, uh, which is the thing that you, we wish you would connect your devices to. Um, and so basically the agenda is an answer these two questions. Um, how are we thinking about connecting devices and hopefully making it easy? Um, if it's not easy enough, you gotta tell us. <laughs> um, and the other thing is, and that's a question we get from a lot of customers. It's like, we understand that when we connect things, magic happens. What's magic? And what do we do once we have all these devices connected? So we'll try to cover that a little bit too. Um, let's dive right into uh, connecting stuff. And um, so these little blue squares, let's say these are devices. Um, they're gonna have to talk um, to something. And so one of the first uh, components we have been working on are field gate, what we call field gateway and protocol gateway. Um, field gateway, the ID is really, um, your devices are not or cannot connect to the internet. Uh, maybe because they only speak Bluetooth or uh, maybe because you have security concerns or you know, whatever your reasons are. So we need an on-premise solution that helps you, that, that can connect to devices and then be a single point of contact between all your devices and the cloud. And so we build an SDK for that, um, the Field Gateway SDK. Um, the second thing we figured is that you might have already have devices connected uh, to the internet and these devices probably speak some sort of protocol. Um, so uh, I'll go into the details of the protocol later with uh, IoT Hub, we support a few of them, but maybe you have your own, or uh, you, you speak a protocol that we don't support yet. And so it'll be ideal if we could have a solution running in the cloud, in our data centers that would speak your language and then trend, uh, transform that into stuff that I Azure IoT can understand. And that's the goal of the protocol gateway. But the main thing, uh, the thing that keeps me busy uh, every day is Azure IoT Hub. And this um, piece of cloud, cloud software uh, is basically a huge data ingestion um, mechanism. Um, it has endpoints for you to send uh, billions of messages from millions of devices, um, and this is one of the things we do kind of well in Azure. Uh, it's a scale. Um, we have, so, so we built software that scales and allow you to send tons of messages. 
And so we are going to get all these messages and, for, and, and present them to you and your, cloud, your IoT backend into a more readable and scalable manner. Uh, and I'll get into the details of that. And of course, because it's Azure, Azure is like a big Lego set um, for cloud architects, um, we have a bunch of stuff that you can connect directly to Azure IoT Hub to um, use whatever data you're sending, uh, whether it's stream analytics, um, machine learning things, if you have trained model you want to feed sensor data to, to you know, do predictive maintenance, things like that. So we have a bunch of building blocks that you can assemble together to build your own IoT solution. Uh, and we'll get into some of the building blocks and some of the stuff we do to help you discover all these building blocks later. Um, but we are going to start at the, the, on the device side and we're going to talk about the different primitives that we have to, um, to talk to Azure IoT Hub. All right, so in order to talk to Azure IoT Hub, the first thing that we need from you is a device identity. And, and so the a device identity for us is basically two things. It's an, a unique identifier and it's a secret that can be used to encrypt communications between your device and, uh, and the cloud. And this is one thing we're a little bit strict about. Um, everything has to go over TLS. We do not do, I guess this is gonna get a few chuckles, but we do not do unsecure stuff. Uh, uh, so it has to be um, over TLS. Um, so whether we use symmetric keys, and so you store them in the registry, in the device registry, and then you find a way to store them on the device, for example, in a TPM, and then you generate a token and you encrypt that TLS connection with the token, or if you're using X509 certificates, um, we need to share some sort of secret in order to secure uh, the connection. Um, and we'll get into the registry a little bit later. Now, once we have, of course, oh yeah, one more in, uh, interesting thing. Um, we actually don't share one secret, we share two secrets, so that if one of them gets compromised, you can roll the keys and, um, and, and keep using your device without having to taking it offline or, or worry about, uh, about maintenance, uh, sending a technician or something like that. Um, obviously, you can, you, we have APIs so that you can create devices one by one, um, but we do like to brag about scale, so we also have bulk APIs that enable you to um, provision um, you know, as many devices as you want in, in, in one API call. Um, now, now that your device has an identity, it's gonna want to connect to Azure, um, and I have a slide later, but I guess I could have started with that. We support three different IoT protocols. Um, oh, IoT-ish. Um, HTTP, not really IoT, but it's gotta be there. Um, it's nice because it allows to punch through firewall, doesn't scale at all. So uh, you can do HTTP if you want, that's not what we uh, recommend. Uh, we are much more fans of MQTT and AMQP, and so whether you're talking one of these three protocols, you can connect your device to, directly to Azure IoT Hub. If you're speaking something else, I don't know, co-op, for example, you're gonna need a protocol gateway or a field gateway. Um, and once we have this connection, so the first and the obvious thing, uh, most obvious thing we can do is, is get messages from, uh, from your devices. And it can be any sort of payload. It doesn't have to be structured. It can be binary. We don't look at it. Um, so um, you can send messages, and these messages will have a payload and what we call properties and uh, we implement properties in AMQP, MQTT, and HTTP in different layers of the protocol. Um, and these properties will be used to route messages to the different endpoints on the cloud side. Um, the other thing we can do is uh, send commands, send messages to the device. And basically, it's the same message, except it goes in the other direction. Uh, we often use D2C, as in device to cloud, and C2D, uh, as in cloud to device. Um, uh, to refer to uh, telemetry and, and, and commands. Um, Microsoft does love its acronyms. Uh, you'll see a lot of those. 
Um, so that's the basic stuff. And everybody does it, so we had to add more stuff. Um, the, uh, another thing we introduced is a primitive called device twin. And the, what the device twin is, you can think of it as a document that lives um, in, 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 a separate st in, in a store in the cloud, and that has three sections. The first section is known only to the cloud application and its tags. It allows you to categorize devices so that then you can query your millions of devices and say, give me all the temperature sensors, for example. Or give me all, I don't know, the devices on the third floor of the Hilton Portland. Um, but that lives only on the cloud. What's really being shared with the device are two other sections called desired and reported properties. And basically, the way it works is the cloud can, your, cl your cloud application can set desired properties and your device will get notifications, hey, you have a new desire, you have a new thing, a new desired property that changed. And your device itself can read these desired properties or get notified for these desired properties and write to reported properties. And then the reported when reported properties change, your cloud applications get notified and you can see, oh, the device reported something new. And the idea is that it complements the telemetry because you're, you're like, well, things going one way, things going, uh, why have two of these? Well, the twin is a document that lives in the cloud. Your device gets disconnected, the twin's still here. So you have some sort of last known state that always exists there that you don't have if your device is disconnected and you have to send a message to read something. Um, the other nice thing you can do with twins is run queries. And the idea is that you want to find, so I was saying you want to find all temperature sensors. You can do that with, obviously, tags. But then maybe you want to find all the temperature sensors that are reporting a temperature over, I don't know, 50 degrees. And, you can, and, and so we have a query engine. And basically, this is stored into a NoSQL database. And, and, and you can just you know, start um, looking at all your devices and, and finding stuff about them that way. Um, so that's twins. Telemetry, commands, twin. Um, we also have one other thing, which is device methods. And it's yet another way to talk to devices. Um, this way is a, is, is, is a little different from the first two. So basically, uh, whether it's telemetry commands, these are messages that goes into queues, and then the device or the cloud reads from these queues, and 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 so it's a very very asynchronous. Um, also, you can manage to do bidirectional communication, like request response, with telemetry and commands, but then you have to match. You know, you have to correlate what's going in, what's coming out. It's not. It's asynchronous. You could have hundreds of messages queued before you get your responses. So. Um, and same with the twin. It's just a document, and it gets read and, and written to, but it's asynchronous. The idea between, behind device method is I need the device to execute code right now and give me the answer for my cloud application. So it's kind of a, a synchronous request. It's not synchronous because it goes over the network, but it's synchronous request. So your device has to be connected, and you're like, give me the last 10 lines of your log file, for example. And this goes to the device, and in the same, H so in the same HTTP request, so your service is talking to Azure IoT Hub, sends an, A sends an HTTP request to Azure IoT Hub, and then wait for the response. And during that time, IoT Hub is going to take the request, send it to the device, get the device to execute some code. The device will send back the response, and you'll get the response in the re HTTP response itself. So it's like a very direct way. We call them direct methods or device methods. It's a very direct way to ask the device to do something. Um, but the caveat is it only works if your device is connected. So if you want to queue stuff for execution later, you can, you can use uh, commands. But if you want the, device, the response right now, you have to have device methods. Um, Another thing that um, you may need or want to do with devices is upload large amounts of data. For example, your device has been disconnected for a while. Let's say it was a container on a container ship. Um, it's been at sea for six weeks. Coming into the port, it has tons of telemetry data. 
you could argue that sending like 50,000 messages one by one of 256K might not be the best way to do that. You'd rather upload a big blob of, of data. And that's what the file upload endpoint does for you. The device is, says, I have a bunch of data to upload. Give me a place to do that. Service respond, hey, here's the place where I can do that. And your device sends the data. And then you can read that data, uh, that blob of data from, from your service. Um, and the nice thing that this thing does is that your device doesn't have to store multiple secrets for multiple endpoints, like the place we're going to upload the file and the way you're talking to IoT Hub. IoT Hub is brokering everything for you. That's the device-facing endpoints. Uh, so I mentioned that, MQTT, AMQP, and HTTP, and the protocol gateway if you need to support something else. Uh, if you need to support something else, we do want to hear about that, though. Um, uh, we started with AMQP and HTTP. We added MQTT uh, per customer request, and that's one of the fun things with Azure IoT, uh, the team I'm a part of, is that we're very much talking directly to the customer. If, you, if you're finding an issue in our GitHub, because all our SDKs are open source, of course, uh, if you're finding an issue, the dev who wrote the code is going to reply to you, which is not always the case at Microsoft. Uh, company's changing. Now, that was the device side. Let's move on to the, uh, the back end. And on the, on the back end, of course, you have uh, kind of symmetrical endpoints to what we have on the device to um, uh, get your telemetry, get uh, send commands, um, get feedback from commands. So that's also something uh, we can do. So that's only supported with AMQP because that built in the protocol, which is the idea that the device accepted or rejected or abandoned the, the, the command that you sent. The file upload notifications, of course, uh, and device management endpoint that allows you to create and change device identities and, and change the state of the device twins. Um, a couple more things, though, on the cloud side. And by the way, I just, I just want to make it clear. Um, it's symmetrical, but it's, it's presented. We can get into the nitty-gritty details if we have more time at the end. But it's presented in a different way. So if you have a million connect device connected, we're not giving you a million of these endpoints, right? We're giving you queues where it's easier to read data from a million different devices. Um, that way, we do the scaling, and you worry about the application. Um, sorry, that was a side note. Uh, going back to, to these endpoints, one thing we added in the, um, in the back end was uh, APIs to schedule tasks that are going to do stuff with your devices, uh, whether it's actually um, changing desired properties uh, when we're talking about twins or executing device methods. And the idea is that Let's say you want uh, all the uh, pressure, I don't know, temperature sensors. Let's stay on the temperature sensor. Uh, you want the temperature sensors to all um, reset or accept a new uh, desired property at 2 a.m. two days from now. And you can, you, can, you can schedule that, and then IoT Hub will take care of that job for you, connect to all the devices to which this, um, this task uh, is applicable to, and, and, and we'll make sure this task runs correctly, and then it, it will give you a nice report saying, hey, this is all the things that worked, this is all the things that didn't work, we think that thing is not connected, um, et cetera. Um, so that's that. Um, support time stamping the way Time stamping events? Time stamping, yeah, everything's time stamped. All the, all the messages that go back and forth, all the um, actually methods won't have a timestamp, but all the messages that you get are, are timestamped, and all the results will have timestamps on them. Yeah. And they're all relative to what? They're UTC time. So Azure is, is synchronized to UTC? Yes. Um, one more thing that we offer on the, uh, on the back end, of course, is something called operations monitoring. And what that does is it allows you to monitor everything, so different levels of events um, pertaining to what is happening with your IoT Hub. Like, hey, there are 50,000 devices with unknown identities trying to connect. 
what's that? Uh, or, um, hey, you're about to get throttled uh, because you didn't pay for it. Um, so we give you alerts of what's going on with your IoT hub, whether it's um, general statistics or just errors um, that enable you to programmatically scale your IoT hub or, um, or change configuration of your IoT hub if you need to. And you could say, hey, what the hell? You told us you were scaling automatically and now you tell me I have to do it. And the reason is um, we don't want some um, malefficient person uh, or not, malin not well meaning person to manage to hack some of your devices or connect and just try and DDoS your service. And um, because basically what you're paying for is a capacity to ingest and send messages. And so if that guy, if, if one guy owns your device, it could potentially throttle you. And so you, we don't want to rake up your bill and say, hey, sorry, you got hacked. A million dollar, please. That would add insult to injury. So instead of that, we just say, hey, you're getting throttled. You need to watch this. And then you can decide how to react to that. You're like, yeah, this is normal activity. Please give me more units. Or you could say, this is not normal. Please do not scale and do not bill me for an inordinate amount of money. Uh, so that's what operations monitoring is for. Um, a new thing we rolled out um, late last year, so I guess a couple months ago, is, is the ability to route messages to different things, uh, different services. In, um, on, on the Azure cloud. And the reason is, before all your telemetry messages were getting randomly assigned to some what we call partitions, which are basically queues that you can read from and they're persistent so that you, you can move a cursor and go back and forth in your messages. And we were kind of telling you, well, read that from the queues and then figure, it out, figure out where you want to send it, you know, to stream analytics or to some machine learning thing or to storage. Uh, our databases, um, and we got the feedback that, hey, it'd be nice if we could do some basic routing ourselves, and you could configure endpoints, and then based on message properties, we would do the routing so that you don't have to write code for that. So that's what it is. Um, and I've included way more stuff in the presentation links, and you can download everything if you want to, including sample codes uh, that show all of these primitives and all these things I talked about, telemetry, <coughs> twins, um, they're just one line of code API. Um, so yeah, we have a bunch of SDKs for devices. I'm going to go back to that. You can manage device identities, millions of messages, route messages to endpoints, upload files, store and query device state, execute code, monitor operations. That, that's what IoT Hub is for. Um, now, how do you get started with IoT Hub? Um, for you just go to the Azure portal, create an account, and spin a new IoT Hub. And the best part of it is it's free as you start. Um, the, basically, what we have is, is a, a SKU system where, based on the capacity you want, you have to pay more or less money. Um, the basic SKU allows for a few thousand messages and, and I don't remember how many devices, I think there's, there's a cap, but it allows you to experiment entirely for free. Uh, all our SDKs are free and open source and available in GitHub. So you can, e even if you want to run your own little automa home automation project, and it's free, go for it. Um, as you scale, you're going to start wanting to switch to some more um, paying uh, SKUs, and then you can add, um, you can multiply these SKUs as you want to scale dynamically. So you really, we really encourage you to start low, see what your plan, kind of plan for your data, um, the amount of data you're going to send, and pay as you go. That's the cloud model, basically. Is there a different QoS no, the QoS is the same no matter what you pay. So you get you get the best stuff even if you're on the free SKU. Um, 
the SDK. So I'm part of the team that write the SDKs for IoT Hub. Um, and obviously, we went where our customers are. Uh, so lots of Android, I, um, uh, Linux, embedded Artos. Um, we do have Windows uh, SDKs. Uh, they're not the ones that are giving us the most work. Um, but we are where you guys are. Um, and I was just talking to the Zephyr uh, folks earlier, and, and we're going to be looking at that too. So um, if you go to our SDKs and you are not finding the platform you're using and you, you want us to build that for you, just let us know on the GitHub. Uh, as far as languages go, uh, our most popular and most portable SDK is, of course, the C SDK. We have very good embedded C engineers um, that provide um, open source SDKs. And by the way, the SDKs include uh, AMQP and MQTT libraries. So if you're looking for portable embedded C, MQTT, or uh, AMQP libraries, you can get that from us, even if you're not using Azure IoT Hub, just saying. Um, we do Node.js, that's my thing. Um, we do Java, .NET, Python. Um, if your thing is not on there, same thing, let us know. We'll look at building it. Um, and the way you get the SDKs is obviously look in your favorite package manager uh, repository, whether it's NPM, Maven, APT, uh, NuGet, if you're into that. Um, or you can clone directly all the source code on GitHub. Um, the gateway, I mentioned the gateway, same thing. With our gateway play right now is an SDK. We are not giving you a device. We figure you already have that device, uh, but you may want to write code um, for uh, that connects to devices and then streams everything to IoT Hub, gateway SDK. Um, it's C-based, so it's very embedded, embeddable, I would say. Um, it's, uh, it does have connectors that allow you to write modules for the gateway in Java, uh, Node, um, and I'm, I'm guessing .NET. Yeah, .NET. Uh, it's a sister team from mine, so I'm a little less uh, aware of that. Uh, we did have a talk earlier during uh, the conference about the gateway. I included the link at the bottom. Um, now, maybe you don't have a device. And if you don't have, a, and, or maybe you are making a device and you want to make sure or advertise that your device is, can connect to Azure IoT Hub. So we also have that, uh, a partner program and a device catalog. And if you go on that address, catalog.azureiotsuite.com, you can find literally hundreds of devices that we have tested and we know our SDKs work on those and they can connect. If you're building devices and you're interested in being there, you also have a link to sign up, and it's really a quick thing. Um, so there you go, device catalog. Now, I'm good on time. Um, we talked about devices, how to connect to these devices, we, uh, how to connect to IoT Hub with these devices. Um, let's maybe, does anyone have questions about the first part? Uh, Let's do a little Q&A first before we jump on that. I did put everybody to sleep. That's what I was afraid of. Can we talk about the memory oh. footprint on the, uh, the embedded device to support? So it depends on what you want to. Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming um, you're talking about the CSDK. OK. Um, the, uh, it depends on what you want to build. The way we built the SDK is we separated the, the protocol stacks from the high-level primitive APIs. And so, um, sure, you can build everything, and it would take a few kilobytes, I think. You can get uh, yeah, quite a few kilobytes. Um, you, could, you can cut the protocols you don't need, and then it'll be building even less. Uh, we have been running our SDKs and Arduinos and ES, uh, ESP8266 and devices like that. So I don't have the exact number. I know it's a few Ks of, uh, of, of memory. Um, building the SDK is another thing because we are macro heavy. <laughs> oh, oh, it, gets, it needs quite a bit of memory to build that thing. But uh, once you're deploying, it's only a few kilobytes. Uh, and if you're looking for 
more precise stuff, let's talk after and I can connect you with the right guys. You had a question? Uh, what kind of data usage do you need to keep a device connected? Like kind of cellular connections can use a whole lot of data. Is there, how configurable is that? Within the limits of the protocol, it's whatever you want to be, I'm going to say. Uh, meaning, um, you have an HTTP, a device that connects over HTTP every two days. We're going to get your connection every two days, and that's it. And the request is as small as you want to make it. You if give up the, uh, device methods? You give up the device methods in, in HTTP, yes. Uh, if you have uh, an always connected device with AMQP or MQTT, it depends on the keep alive you set on, uh, in these protocols. Um, we do rely on the protocol keep alive. Um, the one thing I will say, if you want your device to stay connected, and I think we're working on changing that. I don't want to make any mistake. I'm going to be um, uh, purposely uh, uh, conservative here. Is if you want the device to stay connected, I think the Azure load balancer right now requires you to do something with your socket every four minutes. Can I say? Because um, after, if if you don't get anything after four minutes, we are basically considering your, the thing has disconnected, so we cut the connection. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yes. Question about the security secret. Uh, assuming that I have you know, multiple devices, do they all share the same secret, or does the no. device have individual secrets? No. The device. So. Each device has a unique ID. Each device should have a unique secret. Um, I don't think we're enforcing this. So if you want to put the same secret on all the devices, it's your bad call. Um, but no, each device should have its own secret. Um, and one thing that we are not covering yet for transparency is how to get this secret on the device. Uh, we are certainly looking at a bunch of things and trying to make this easier for customers, but right now it's still the customer's responsibility to provision that secret on the device and to find a secure way to store it on the device. We have some uh, demos and, uh, and code that shows, for example, how to store it into a TPM on the Windows IoT Core uh, stuff, because we have good TPM uh, support on IoT Core. Um, if you're working on these topics, we have engineers working on these topics too. Uh, and we definitely want to hear about that, but we don't have anything fancy to offer right now for provisioning. Questions? All right. Um, now, Azure, I mentioned before, it's that big Lego set for cloud architects. You have a bunch of different components, databases, uh, stream analytics, machine learning, um, hosting mechanisms, whether it's for VMs or for apps, uh, serverless computing, if you want. Um, so you can really build your own thing, connect these Lego bricks together, and build your own solution. Um, and that's how we started. We were not prescriptive about what should be the cloud, the IoT cloud application uh, architecture uh, at first. Uh, we did realize that um, a lot of our customers had no idea where to start on that. And so what we did was uh, build what we call pre-configured solutions. And what pre-configured solutions are is basically a default architecture to solve one, one of the many problems the industry would like to solve. And so we built two of those. One of them is predictive maintenance, and the other is remote monitoring. Um, the, and I'll get into the details of that. Um, again, if you'd like to see some patterns, uh, additional pre-configured solutions, we have folks working on that, we want to hear about it. Uh, but what these guys give you is basically a file that you can upload to Azure and will initialize everything for you. The web jobs, the stream analytics processing, the machine learning, um, and the things that you, want, that you would like to use. And we back these with real customers. Um, I don't think I remember who was doing remote monitoring. The predictive maintenance uh, I like because it's Rolls-Royce airplane engines, and I like airplanes. Uh, so um, 
that was pretty fun. And so what we give you, and I understand this might not be very readable from the back, but what, what it gives you basically is, is all, it provisions all these components for you so that in a few minutes you can connect devices to these pre-configured solutions and see stuff running. In the case of remote monitoring, what we have is basically a web app here that's going to present to you a dashboard with a list of devices, the data that is being sent by devices, and some stream analytics here that are going to be able to do anomaly detection. Basically, you're saying, hey, if this sensor goes over this threshold, or if these sensors meshed, uh, meshed up together with some mathematical formula get to that point, you can raise an alert and then do something with it in your application. And, um, and of course, in order to store all the data that's being sent, we're also provisioning storage. Um, and, and that will enable you to go back and look at your data in time. Um, so that's what the portal looks like. You have a bunch of devices. You can add rules for the, the anomalies you want to detect. And, and that's the dashboard you get. Um, with little, nice little graphs and a little map. Uh, of course, it's the Seattle area, right? <laughs> that's where we live. Um, and so you get that literally. So if you go to azureiotsuite.com, you click on um, remote monitoring, and 15 minutes later, you have all that built for you, and you can play with it. Um, it is a reference architecture. Um, demo, call it what you want. All the code source is open sourced, of course. Um, uh, you can customize it the way you want. Um, we are not selling this as, hey, if you want to do remote monitoring, here's how our support and packed up solution for you, right? This is an example of how you would like to build this thing. Um, same for predictive, well, same difference. Uh, predictive maintenance, in that case, we illustrated how to run machine learning um, on the data you get. So um, you find the same basic building blocks, right? You get devices over there, and we provide them. OK. And we, uh, we provide a device simulator in case you don't have uh, devices to connect. And that goes through IoT Hub. You have stream analytics job that allow you to run queries on the data route the data on different endpoints so that you still get you know, these nice little graphs. Um, but we also uh, use this data into a job that runs, the, um, runs your, the current data on the trained model that you established using the Azure machine learning uh, <coughs> component. And, so, and that way, you can detect, um, uh, you can detect uh, what or, or predict what is going to happen based on the sensor data and the established model you have. So typically, and then of course we have a web app to manage that, uh, a database to store the data. Uh, this is kind of the same as the, the remote monitoring stuff. And what it looks like is this. Um, so you get your nice little graphs, and and here what, what you probably cannot read is remaining useful life on the engines. And basically what we did was we took the maintenance logs for these engines, fed that into a machine learning algorithm, and now we're looking at the data of, that is coming in real time from the sensors. And we're like, hey, last time I saw this pattern, 20 hours later, the engine, that part of the engine failed or, or the performance started degrading or something like that. And so we enable Rolls-Royce to detect the potential problems before they happen. Um, so yeah, pretty fun stuff. Uh, OK, more of the same. That's the um, Azure Machine Learning Studio. That's where you, you define uh, the different components of the machine learning algorithm you want to use and how you, you know, um, where you upload the model, train, etc. To be honest, this is I, I wish I was more proficient with that. Uh, this is a little far away from my daily SDK development tasks. Um, but like I said, everything's on GitHub. So you want to look at how we are doing that, just go for it. Um, and now we're into more like the end of the talk and announcement. I'm on time. Um, 
we did roll out or announce for CES a connected vehicle platform. Uh, and the idea behind the connected vehicle platform is we want to be talking to car makers because we realized that for many car makers, and funny enough, the first one with the French one, funny for me, I guess, um, the um, cloud, uh, car manufacturers don't always have an idea of what services and how to, to offer customers and how, how we can build these intelligent services for customers when it, come to, when it comes to connected cars. And so we, we said, well, let's, let's do the thinking together and roll out a partnership where we're going to build solutions for connected cars together. Um, so that's coming. If you want to be a part of it, you know, come see us, talk to us on the GitHub or wherever. Um, we also rolled out a security program. Um, Microsoft security, uh, very long love-hate uh, history. Um, uh, the Azure folks working in, working in security are pretty impressive, if you ask me. But uh, the, um, the idea is that, same thing, customers are like, hey, you know, we understand it's a big deal. We watched the news last year. Uh, how can you help us do that? And so we have a program where we partner with security companies, security firms, and we develop best practices and white papers, and we talk to customers about how to secure the whole IoT solution. I included the links for that, um, too. And that's the end. I'm, I'm actually a little bit early. So you guys get a head start for lunch, or we can do questions. I'm, I'm going to stay here and do questions anyway. Thanks for your attention and for listening, even though I speak in a very monotone voice. Um, questions? <laughs> yes? Yes. How the, does that, those, those pre-configured solution dashboards work? Is that something that could be extended to customer? Or is that Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the goal of Power BI, Power BI is yet another kit, if you, if you will, by Microsoft uh, that enables customers to build dashboards. And was that pre-configured to Power BI? Yes. And, um, and, and so, yeah, Power BI can read from very different you know, data sources, storage, obviously, stream analytics. And, and so you just configure the Power BI solution for that. And, and it comes pre-configured in the pre-configured solutions. Haven't had one, Microsoft, one job at Microsoft in that talk. I cannot believe that. Well, you guys have been an amazing crowd. I've been in the booth all day yesterday. and. We were very well received. It's really cool, and I'm kind of surprised still. Oh, um, I had a question on the messages. So uh -huh. what sort of bandwidth limitations do you have in terms of the amount of data that can be shared from the device? How, how does that work? How does that work? Um, that's kind of the secret sauce. Uh, what is going to limit, well, we don't have a bandwidth limit. Okay. Try I mean, us. In terms of pricing, right. you know. Stuff well, like th that, that's the thing. That's uh, <laughs> so so that, the question is about, is about the price. All right. So Azure has a really nice tool, and I think I may have mentioned oh, it. Uh, right. So the, the price calculator, uh, I think it was before that. Right. We have a pricing calculator. And based on, and, and so in that pricing calculator, you select IoT Hub and you say, I want unlimited devices and I don't know, 4 million messages a day. And it says that's that much. And then you have, it's that much per unit. And then you can add units. Like you, so you can. How about streaming though? What if I was doing streaming from an IP source? Yes. Like I said, try one um, Azure is one of the um, uh, most underestimated thing at Microsoft. Um, one thing I like to say, so we understand scale. There are not that many cloud providers 
out there that understand hyperscale, we can marketing term, the way we do. Um, we have more data centers all over the world running Azure and deployed than AWS and Google combined. So whenever we are talking about streaming capacity to ingest stuff, I'm like, yeah, try us. Uh, we want to find out <laughs> so that we can scale even, uh, even more. Um, <clears throat> it counts. The way we count that is in uh, message units. A message unit is 4K, I think, um, and you buy them by the million. Yes. Yep. Well, we're part of the MQTT five working group, so I guess I guess we can say we're looking at that. Uh, I don't want to announce anything or, 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 or you know, but obviously we're working with the industry uh, uh, standard bodies and and groups. Um, to be honest, we would like the customers to not care about the protocol. We think if you want to develop smart IoT stuff, we need to get you to trust us. We'll figure out the plumbing for you, concentrate on you know, the, the higher level primitives where you're gonna build the intelligence. Um, we started with HTTP and AMQP. MQTT was obviously big feedback. We had a bit of an experiment on our first device management uh, beta. Um, with LWM2M and a version of co-op that was running over TCP instead of UDP, and that didn't work out well. Um, so I don't know if we can make any plans or commitments or whatever, but yeah, we're, yeah. Yeah, obviously MQTT is up there uh, as far as industry is concerned. Yes? Could you talk briefly, uh, perhaps about networking in particular, um, how these tools, uh, like Um, this is going to be a, a bad answer. Um, we let you guys figure this out. Bad answer, sorry. Um, our software just runs on the device and assumes that we have some sort of connectivity. We are not trying to be smart about punching through firewalls and things like that. We use the configuration, the parts you give us, um, and that's it. D does that answer your yeah, question? Yeah, but, yeah, okay. I mean, yeah. but do you guys have any other tools, or is there, like, I mean, is it, is it truly on our own, or is there like, some guidelines? So, no, it's pretty much on your own. Uh, we do have one thing, and that might be at attached to your question, uh, but we do have one thing, one little tool called IoT Hub Diagnostics. So if you're wondering, hey, am I going to be able to connect from this network or that network? You can just download, download this little tool, run it, and you'll test all the, um, you give it, you have to have an IoT hub so you can start with the free instance. Uh, you give that tool the connection string, which is the, 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 uh, the configuration basically for your device to connect to IoT hub. And what this thing will do is create a fake device and IoT hub, test all the protocols, and give you a nice little report saying, hey, AMQP didn't work, but AMQP over WebSocket worked. Uh, or, and and it, goes that, it does that for AMQP, MQTT, and HTTP. Yeah, did I mention we do WebSockets? We do AMQP and MQTT over regular TCP sockets and over secure WebSockets. There, I said it. That, that reads one minute. I need to change my glasses. One minute, right? Three? Okay. I really need to change my glasses. Thank you. Question? All right. Cool. Were you expecting something else from this talk? Did I leave questions unanswered? Were you surprised at all with anything? Yes? Right. Well, I will go back to the... Uh, 
Microsoft booth that we have in the sponsor uh, showcase for the, well, I guess it's closing now, but yeah, I'll go back there if you guys want to have more of a private talk. And uh, thank you very much.